Go ahead and have a seat, and I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and we'll be going through verses 30 through 40. And as you're turning there, I want to start by reading a prophecy to you from Isaiah 55. So take a moment to get there, and I'm just so encouraged uh, that you're in the house of the Lord this morning seeking Christ. I pray that's why you have come And I pray that the Spirit of God would meet you as we open his holy word. But would you uh, just park yourself in John chapter 6 for a moment. And and as I read Isaiah 55 and some verses from it, would you allow it to be worshipped to your soul? Hear the word of the Lord this morning. It says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Verse 6 goes on. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he abundantly will pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than than your thoughts. Now this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 55, it rang out for 700 years to the Jewish people before this moment that we're studying in John chapter six. Within those 700 years was 400 years of silence. Yahweh didn't speak, there were no new prophets, no new covenants, no new liberation, just waiting, just oppression, just more bondage for the Jewish people. And the Jews, they were waiting for what Isaiah 55 makes sound so good, right? Uh, Water and wine and milk for those with no money, delighting in rich food, the end to laboring and that which doesn't satisfy, a soul that is satisfied and lives. Who wouldn't want to indulge in a free meal that is soul satisfying, inexplicably compassionate and abundantly pardoning? Everyone would raise their hand and want to indulge in that meal. But for 700 years, the Jews continued to starve in their inner being. And in John 6, we saw last week that the selfish, seeking, miracle, mooching Jews are still starving for something to satisfy their souls. They came looking to have their physical hunger quenched, but the truth of their problem is they are spiritually malnourished spiritually starved individuals. Jesus said to them, do not work for the food that perishes, but understand this is not just a Jewish problem, not just a problem for this crowd in John 6, 2000 years ago. This is the problem of all of humanity for all time. Every person that's been born into this world is spiritually malnourished and spiritually starving. The majority of the world today is starving for something that will satisfy their souls. The moment that you were born into this world, you were starving for something to satisfy your soul, but you didn't know to look for it. And that's why we run down all sorts of different paths, filling our lives with all the things we can get our hands on, trying to find satisfaction, and we keep coming up empty. Blaise Pascal was an early physicist. He said this, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. That's true of all of us. God-shaped vacuum in your life that you've spent time trying to fill. Maybe you're here trying to fill it today. You've come into the walls of the church knowing that your life has no purpose, knowing that it has no meaning, knowing that there's something better out there for you, and yet everything you continue to try continues to leave you searching, starving, hungry for something. Now that leads us to the most beautiful response 
that Jesus gives to this crowd. It's the first of seven I am statements that are woven throughout the gospel of John. And it's a response that is still ringing loudly today, like Isaiah 55 rang aloud for the Jews. It beckons all to come to the waters to buy wine and milk and bread without money, without price, and be satisfied. That's good news today. So the the big idea that we'll draw out of this text is this. The love of God invites you to come and eat freely of the all-satisfying bread of life. The love of God, which we sang about already this morning, and I want this message to come through the lens of God's love. It invites you to come and eat freely of the all-satisfying bread of life. Let's get our eyes on a copy of John chapter 6, starting in verse 30. We'll go through 40 today. Hear the word of the Lord. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let's pray together. Father, as we pray this morning, as we approach your word in John 6, I echo verse 40, this is the will of Our God who is in heaven, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Lord Jesus, we ask in your kindness and your goodness that you would move among us even as we study these words today. We thank you that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword and able to reprove and correct and train us for righteousness. Spirit of God, we need you to speak uh, even as we think of lofty things and and our own salvation, Lord. We need the Spirit of God to draw upon our hearts and draw upon our minds to stop and to marvel at your goodness, marvel at your grace to save us. And so, Lord, I pray that this message would draw some sinners to repentance. I pray that this message would shake some selfish seekers awake. And, Lord, I pray that your Spirit, through your word, would help us to marvel at the grace of God to put us in Christ and save us to eternal life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Now, let's just first remember where we've been, okay? So we're three weeks in now to John chapter six. Uh, The night before this scene, Jesus fed 20,000 plus people. Uh, It was a miracle. He took mere fragments of food and created an abundance of food through these fish and loaves. And the people were jazzed about it. Best meal they had ever eaten. And so they get pretty pumped. They wanna make Jesus king for their own selfish reasons. But Jesus withdraws and he goes off because he's on his father's timeline, ultimately heading toward the cross of crucifixion. Well, his disciples go across the sea. There's a massive storm and Jesus meets his disciples by walking across the stormy sea on the water, gets in the boat, takes them safely to shore. And the next day, these people wake up hungry again and they go looking for Jesus to find that great bread that he provided. But we said last week, selfish seekers might fool some, but they will never fool Jesus. And so these people may have looked like they were seeking Jesus, but their hearts were far from him. Uh, They were more concerned with their bellies being filled than they were with worshiping Christ who made the bread. So they were marveling at the miracle, not the man. But today, as we jump into this text, I want to take it in three portions. I want the holy, steadfast love of the Lord to be a focal point for us as we look at John 6, 30 through 40. We'll see God's love for the world, God's love for his son, 
and God's love for the church through this passage, okay? So here's point number one. God so loved the world that he gave the bread of life. God so loved the world that he gave the bread of life. Let's look at verse 30 and we'll just work our way through the text. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? So you remember last week, verse 27, don't work for the food that perishes, work for that which endures to eternal life. And they say, what work can we do, Jesus? And Jesus said in verse 29, you need to believe in me. You need to entrust your life to me. You need to believe that I am God in the flesh. Now look at verse 26, and you'll remember Jesus' rebuke to this crowd. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So this crowd, they're like, okay, Jesus, you say we missed the signs. You're telling us to believe in you. What work are you going to do to prove that we should? <laughs> Which is such a wild statement, right? Considering that yesterday they saw Jesus make all that bread and fish out of barely anything and then they ate it with their own two lips. But isn't that just like you and I? Like so often we forget the provisions and the mercies of yesterday and we wake up the next day wondering where God is, wondering if God is faithful, wondering if God's gonna meet our needs. He, he put breath in your lungs yesterday, food on your table yesterday, answered some of your prayers yesterday and we wake up today feeling as if God is distant and our lives are hopeless at times. How fickle can we be? Just like this crowd, we can be fickle and seek Jesus for our own selfish gain. But this particular crowd, they're just hungry. And so they're, they're seeking Jesus to do a miracle, to fill their bellies. And remember why they're there? This crowd was in town gathering in Jerusalem, near Jerusalem for the Passover. We read that back in verse four. So what do you think and who do you think was fresh on their mind as they've gathered in this large crowd to see Jesus? They were probably thinking about the Exodus the liberation of the Israelites from Egypt, thinking about God's provision in the wilderness. They were probably thinking about Moses, their beloved hero. And that's precisely where they take the conversation as they try to trick Jesus into giving them another free meal. So look at verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're like, you want us to believe that you're God? You want us to put our trust in you, Jesus? Then show us a sign comparable to what the great Moses did for our forefathers out in the wilderness. Yeah, you fed us some good bread yesterday, but Moses fed our forefathers bread every day. They got breakfast, lunch, and dinner thousands of times. Moses fed our people in the wilderness. Are you greater than our father Moses? That's what they're saying to Jesus in this moment. Prove it. So look at verse 32, Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. That's pretty direct. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now just understand how audacious that statement is from Jesus to the Jews. They hold Moses in high regard. They're looking for another human like Moses who will give them physical provision and political power and earthly liberation. And now here's Jesus, a lowly carpenter from Nazareth. And he says, it wasn't Moses who fed you. It wasn't your beloved Moses. It was my father. And when he says my father, the Jews know that he's speaking of Yahweh, which in their minds, this is blasphemous for Jesus to claim that. But what Jesus is proclaiming is Moses was merely a gatherer. It's God who was the provider. Moses was used by God, sure, just like you might be used by God, but God is ultimately the giver of all things. Now, I just really quickly wanna point out the parallels in John chapter six between Moses and Jesus. It is shouting at us that Jesus is the true and greater Moses. But all through John, we see the Pharisees and the Israelites just propping up Moses like he is the end all be all of their salvation and liberation. But in Exodus 15, the people had nothing to eat as the crowd did in John chapter six, right? Nothing to eat. But in the wilderness, Moses instructed people to gather manna from the ground. So we see back in Exodus and Deuteronomy that manna covered the wilderness ground like dew every morning. And they would go and they would gather it. 
But Jesus took those fish and crackers and he thanked God, his father, and an abundance of food, leftover food, all that they could eat went across the field. Moses lifted up his staff to part the Red Sea, but Jesus in John 6, what did he do? He walked across the stormy sea. He's got power over the physical laws of nature. Moses was a prophet sent by God. He proclaimed another prophet would come. And the people said, Jesus is the prophet who is to come. He indeed was, but they were missing his deity. Moses retreated to the mountain at the idolatrous response of the Israelites. And Jesus withdrew from the self-centered Jews to the mountain by himself. In Exodus 16, 4, the Lord said, Behold, I am raining down bread from heaven. And in John 6, Jesus says his father gives true bread from heaven, not just for the Jews, but true bread from heaven for the world. Jesus is greater than Moses. Even with manna every day in the wilderness, the Israelites grumbled, they complained, and they eventually died. But Jesus is about to tell them that with the bread that he offers, his life, you will never hunger again and you will never die. Now at the end of chapter five, we dealt with some of this. Look back at chapter five, verse 45 and 46. This was to the Pharisees. Jesus is rebuking them. And remember, they thought they were saved. They thought they were the best keepers of the law. Jesus said, do not think that I will accuse you to my father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. <laughs> How awesome is that? Jesus, the one they've been waiting for, the true and greater Moses, the prophet, the, the, the man who would come to crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the woman from Genesis 3, he's there. They've been waiting all these years and they're missing it. And Jesus is saying the Old Testament, the prophecies, your prophets, your beloved Moses, they were all writing about me. They were all pointing to me and here I am. And Moses led the Jews out of slavery to the Egyptians, but Jesus came to lead the world out of slavery to sin. Now look at verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. <laughs> so they're not picking up what Jesus is putting down here. They're clouded in unbelief. They're stuck in sin's bondage. They're motivated by earthly craving, ignorant to their spiritual need, which is just how you and I are when we're born into this world conceived by sin. They're hungry for food, but not hungry for the glory of God. And Jesus, he's thankfully perfectly patient because I'd probably be losing my, my patience at this point as I'm talking to this crowd and trying to explain to them my deity. But I think their ignorance is why he so emphatically answers them in verse 35. Have you ever tried to tell your kids something and they're not getting it? So you just kind of like sharply give it to them as directly as you can. Look at verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You dummies. He's more patient than that. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. God so loved the world that he gave the bread of life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you see what this is saying? Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the all satisfying bread of life. If you would stop seeking a meal and start seeking Jesus, you'd be satisfied, Jews, in an Isaiah 55 type of way. If you'll quit being driven by the temporal, you'll see your desperate need for spiritual sustenance. And understand, this has been everyone's problem in John so far, and it's often our problem. We are prone to walk by sight and not by faith, right? We get our eyes on what we can see, and we wrap our hands around what we can grasp, and we build up our resumes and our lifestyles with what we can get our hands on, and, and yet walking by faith is what Christ has called us to. Just think about where we've been, Nicodemus in chapter 3. He's focused on the physical. He's like, you want me to climb back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says, no, you need a spiritual rebirth. You gotta be born not of flesh, not of blood, but of God. <laughs> and think about John 4, the woman at the well. She's like, I don't wanna lug these buckets back and forth to the well every single day. I just need something to quench my thirst. And Jesus is like, you don't need that water. You need me. You need salvation water, living water. And now this crowd Looking for bread, Jesus says, you need the bread of life. So what is keeping you from living your life 
for things of eternal value? What temporary pleasures are causing your hunger and satisfaction for Jesus to dwindle? If this crowd can be standing right in front of Jesus and missing it because of the bread that they desired, what things do you desire that cause you to miss Jesus every day? What things do you need to extract from your life? What food that is perishing do you need to get out of your life and repent of and set aside so that you would see Jesus as the all-satisfying bread of life? To the Jews, he says, take a note from your forefathers who ate the manna in the wilderness. They weren't satisfied. They all died. And if you feast on this world and, and, and the things in it, you will surely die as well. But Jesus says, if you'll come to me, if you'll look to me, if you'll feast on me, you will never hunger again. Now, really quickly, in the first I am statement, there's three just awesome things that I got to pull out. The deity of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, and the invitation to come and believe. So back in Exodus 3, verse 14, whenever Moses goes to the burning bush, he says, who are you? And God says, I am that I am. That's the reputation of Yahweh, our God, meaning I am the God of glory. I am unchanging. I am immutable. I am omnipresent. I am omniscient and all-knowing. I am creator and sustainer. I am eternal and absolute. I am the Lord of all. I've always been and I always will be. And as John gives us seven I am statements, each is a claim that only God could make. Jesus is either crazy, he's either lying, or he truly is God in the flesh, echoing Exodus 3.14 when he says, I am the bread of life. So we're seeing that Jesus is 100% God, but then we also see that he's 100% man in his reference to being the true bread from heaven. It speaks of his incarnation. It speaks of Jesus' coming down, him dwelling among us so that we could see the glory of God. Just as God supplied manna from heaven in Exodus, God gave himself from heaven in the form of his son. Jesus came from heaven to earth so that one day you could go from earth to heaven. He came down so that you could go up. He became fleshly so that you could one day become eternal. And that is the glory of the gospel. But then finally, we see an invitation from the God-man for the world to come and believe. Look at verse 35. You got to see it. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That's good news. The Jews wanted a man like Moses to give him earthly and physical freedom and restoration. But Jesus says, I have come that the whole world might be satisfied that the whole world might come and believe. Jews and Gentiles, Americans and Africans, rich and poor. Because of Jesus, you can sit here today and worship freely. Ultimately, Jesus presents man's responsibility to the crowd as it pertains to his presence that's standing right in front of them. You either come to me and believe in me and be satisfied forever or, get this y'all, because it's the same invitation today, or you will reject Jesus, walk away from Jesus, and continue hungering in the wilderness of your sin apart from Christ until you die an eternal death. So it begs the question this morning at church, have you responded to the invitation of Jesus? Have you responded to Christ's invitation to come and partake, to come and believe on him? The Bible says that it means confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus is God and God raised him from the dead. Has that taken root in your life? Is that true of you? I would invite you to respond even right there if the Father is moving. But if you have, if you have responded, if you have partaken of the bread of life, then you know that you've never been so satisfied You've you've found something that bread and water could never quench, amen? You found a never-ending well of sustenance that causes you to hunger and thirst all the more for the righteousness that comes by faith. So praise God for salvation, but many will not believe. Many will reject the person of Jesus Christ. The, The gate is wide that leads to destruction. So I want you to look at verse 36. Jesus says, but I said to you that you have seen me 
and yet do not believe. This is Jesus, right? Jesus presented the gospel. Jesus presented the opportunity. Jesus offered eternal, all-satisfying bread in himself. Was Jesus a failure of an evangelist? Appears like it. (laughs) Is he like wringing his hands all of a sudden? Like, did I not make the gospel clear enough? Did I not make the opportunity clear enough for people to come to me? Because we're going to see later that they just completely reject. They grumble at his words and they walk away. Jesus, the God of glory, standing right in front of them. See, Jesus presented them with man's responsibility to come and believe. But as we go on, we see that his confidence is rooted in his father's sovereignty. He's the messenger doing the work. His father is the gatherer drawing all to himself who would come and believe. Let's go to point number two. God so loves the son that he has given you to him by grace. God so loves the son that he has given you to him by grace. Look at verse 37 and 38. All that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I'll be honest, these aren't easy verses to explain, but they are beautiful verses to reflect on and contemplate and study. Maybe through sleepless nights at times. I've had sleepless nights. Trying to wrestle with some of these concepts in John chapter six. There's a beautiful reality about your salvation that if you will think on it and maul over it in the power of the spirit, you will hunger all the more for God. Now there are two lenses represented in all who have been saved. There's man's lens and there's God's lens. Man's lens, God's lens. From man's lens, your point of view is that you are a Christian because of the day that you repented and believed. You hopefully can point to that day, that time in your life when you came to Jesus, you repented and believed. From my point of view, I gave my life to the Lord at the top of steps at my childhood home because of my parents' faithfulness to preach this very message that Jesus is preaching. And I repented and believed and my life's never been the same. It's not been perfect, but the Father has been drawing me to himself and has been creating a clean heart in me over time. That's from my lens. But now from God's lens concerning your salvation, he has given you as a love offering to his only begotten son so that you could be found in him for the rest of eternity. And that should cause you to say, why me? If you're at all in touch with the depravity of your soul and the darkness of your heart and the captivity of your own mind, you would say, why would God love me? Why would God save me? Why would God send his son for me? If you're in Christ today, your salvation is not of your own works. It's not of your own doing. It's not simply of your own belief or faith. For apart from the spirit of God, you have nothing. You are as spiritually depraved and eternally confused as this hungry crowd that was standing in front of Jesus missing the glory. That's how we come into this world. The answer of Jesus seems so obvious to all of us who have been saved. And yet so many continue to reject it because they're blinded by their own unbelief and they love this world. You love this world before you love Jesus. So from the eternal lens of God, your salvation is by the unmerited favor and steadfast love of God the Father who before the foundation of the world had his affections and his rescue plan set on you. He saw you before you existed. He knew every sin you'd ever commit. He saw no righteousness in you that would make you worthy of his presence. He saw every moment where you would reject the invitation to come and to turn from the things of this world And yet because of the great love with which he loved you, he has made you alive in Christ Jesus. And it is by grace that you have been saved. He has given you to his son in death, burial, and resurrection. He has seated you on high with his son. And you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places if you are in Christ today. And that should cause you to marvel, to worship, and to say, why me? Jesus declares to the world, whoever comes and whoever believes will be satisfied and saved, but rather than fretting over man's unbelief that's right in front of him, 
Jesus is confident in the love of his father to give to him all who would come and his father's ability to save. Woven throughout this passage, woven throughout the gospel of John is our salvation as believers. And, and, and this is so much bigger than us. Understand that. So beyond what we can comprehend. I, I read it in Isaiah 55 verse 9. But this was the prophecy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God is sovereign. He, he's big. And yet he's gracious and he's imminent and he comes close through the person of Jesus Christ. Running through the Bible and through John are, are two parallel cables that are never meant to, meant to intersect, though we try to intersect them at times. And sometimes we like to emphasize one over the other, but we see two cables that are very necessary. And if you've ever driven on a bridge, you know that both cables are necessary for getting across, right? Right? So you have the cable of man's responsibility in salvation to repent and to believe and to put their faith in Christ and to obey his word. And you have the cable of God's sovereignty to give a people to his beloved son. That's running into eternity, y'all. And, and I've argued with a lot of people and I, I've had sleepless nights and you probably debate those things if you go to a Christian college and you have all these kinds of things. But all through scripture, we see this taking place. And can you just marvel with me at the truth that if you are in Christ today, it's because the Father has given you to the Son. Let that cause you to worship. When I get to heaven someday, I will not pat myself on the back for my repentance, faith, and belief. Promise you that. When I get to heaven someday, I will fall on my knees to the praise of his glorious grace with a why me attitude, and yet he will pick me up in his love and grace and say, well done, good and faithful servant. That is our God. So just marvel at the father to give you to his son. Think of yourself as that unbelieving, deceived crowd. Think of yourself as those selfish seekers. Think of yourself as completely focused on temporal satisfaction and the worldly comforts. And then think about the day when the light bulb came on for you regarding salvation. Think about that day. S something changed, right? <laughs> the light bulb came on and that was not all you. <laughs> that was not of your own intellect or your own morality or your own goodness or your own religiosity. That was because of God. And so he initiated that, he orchestrated that, he gave his son for that. And John 6, says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So the day that you profess Jesus as Lord, God, Yahweh, who was in the beginning, he drew you to himself. The day that you made Jesus king of your life, God gave you as a gift to his only begotten son, the day you surrendered your life, God revealed to you that he killed his son in your particular place. It's personal. It was my sin that held him there until he was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life and I know that it is finished. So I won't boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. God loved you before you loved him so that one day you could love him to the praise of his glorious grace. Now, why is that beautiful? Why is the sovereignty of God and salvation a glorious truth to ponder? Because it makes our obedience to Christ worship rather than obligation. It will make your devotion to Jesus delight rather than duty. And isn't that how we, we get temporal? We get on our responsibility and we're like, I gotta go read my Bible because I'm a Christian. I gotta make sure I'm in right standing with the big man upstairs. I gotta do things right. I gotta, I gotta go to church. I gotta worship. But flip that. If you're just overwhelmed with God's goodness to give you to his son, you'll be the greatest worshiper in the room. You'll love your Bible. You'll love to pray. You'll wanna get on your knees and seek Christ. You'll be able to count your trials as joy and not drudgery. James 1.18, of his own will, he has brought you forth so that you would be a first fruits of his creation. Of his own will, of the will of God, he brought some of you forth. 
And if you're here today and you're in Christ, you can count your trials as joy because you know that when you rise up in steadfastness under them, he's creating a more perfect and complete you. And he started something that he promises to finish in all whom he gives to his son. The day you surrendered your life to God revealed the love of God in your life and it makes your worst days hopeful rather than devastating. It makes your best days dependent rather than prideful and the beauty of God giving you to his son and drawing you to himself is seen in the unworthiness of your sinful soul. Look at verse 37, it ends with Jesus saying, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out means no one's beyond the reach of the gospel. No one's beyond the need of the gospel. I've heard it as a pastor. Uh, people say, I can't come to Jesus because of my past. I can't come to Jesus because I've done too many wrong things. I was in prison. I've done heinous things. I've got way too much in my past. And here's the truth. If God has drawn you and if he has turned the light bulb on in your heart so that you would repent and believe and, and respond to the gospel, if he is giving you to his son, there is nothing in your past than, that, that can keep you from Jesus wrapping his arms around you. There's nothing in your past that can keep you from experiencing the love of God for eternal life. The opposite's true. Some of us think we're too good or, or we've done enough good things or we've had a squeaky clean, clean life and so we're on good standing with God, but there is no one so good that they do not need the father to give them to his perfect son so that they can find a security in something beyond themselves. If you're here today and you're secure in yourself, you'll be of the people who stand before God and say, look at all the things that we've done. And God says, depart from me, I never knew you. So stop laboring for the food that perishes. Come and eat of the bread of life, this alone will satisfy, but once you've embraced God's love to give you to his only son in salvation, and once you've come, repented, and believed in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you will find that your soul is satisfied, but your hunger never is. God's love for, for you should cause you to seek him all the more, worship him all the more, pray all the more, persevere all the more. One pastor said it this way, the strongest, most mature Christians I have ever met are the hungriest for God. It might seem that those who eat most would be least hungry, but that's not the way that it works with an inexhaustible fountain, an infinite feast, and a glorious Lord. Keep coming. You can keep coming. You can keep coming to the table if Jesus is the bread that you seek. God loves the world that he gave the bread of life. God loves the son that he's given you to him by grace. Point number three, God so loves the church that you will never be lost and will be raised up to eternal life. You'll never be lost and raised up to eternal life. The reality of God's love for the world and his love for his son is made manifest in his love for the church if you are in Christ today. It's true, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world. God loves you if you reject him. God loves you if you hate him. God loves you if you deny him. God loves you if you don't believe in him, but it's God's desire that you would not stay dead in the world it's God's desire that you would be raised up to new life, that you would be found in his son, that you would be added to his bride. It's God's desire to give you to the son. And when he does, we become a part of the bride of Christ that are being built up. We become part of the church, the holy cosmic temple of the Lord that he's building up. So if you're in Christ today, you are eternally secure. Get this from verse 37, or sorry, 39. You're eternally secure you're never to be lost, never to be cast out, but you will be raised up to eternal life on the last day. So look at verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me. And remember, Jesus came to do his father's will. And that's what believers should do. The will of God, not our own will. That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Have you ever lost something that you value or that you treasure? I've lost like my wallet my keys, I've lost my AirPods. Jesus will never lose what's been given to him. Jesus will never lose what's valuable to him. And understand that if you're a Christian today, that's you. You're the bride of Christ, you're, you're the church and Jesus will never lose you nor cast you out. So what this is saying is you can't lose real salvation. If you've truly been set apart, 
If you've truly been given to the Son by God and, and Jesus has received you through repentance and faith and, and he will not cast you out, you can't lose real salvation. So you might know people who profess to be a Christian at one point, now they don't. You might know people who uh, look the part, walk the walk, talk the talk, but now their lives are a train wreck and they don't have nothing to do with the church. These verses help us conclude that those people were never truly saved to begin with. They've never truly repented and turned from this world, maybe for a time, maybe they were seeking things to fill temporal needs, to fill a God-sized vacuum, but they were never truly saved. They were never given to the son because the son doesn't cast out or lose those who truly come to him. And the selfish seekers in John chapter six, they help us see that it's possible to look saved and not be saved. And I want that to be a conviction to you in this room today. It's, it's possible to look saved, say you believe in Jesus, come to church week after week, look the part and not be saved. And that will be the scariest day, the worst day in history when you stand before God thinking you have access into the kingdom of heaven and he tells you no. So don't fake it because you won't make it. <laughs> you come to Jesus on his terms, you bow to him as Lord and every tongue that confesses and bows now will glor we'll glorify him for an eternity. So if you could have lost your salvation, you would have lost it by now. I would have too. But verse 40, for this is the will of my father that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. If you're here today and you're struggling with God's lens in salvation and whether or not God has given you to his son. My message is the same as Jesus' message to this crowd. Look on the son. Believe in Jesus. Have eternal life. You need the true bread from heaven. You need the bread of life that is able to satisfy the hunger of your soul. Going back to Exodus, you think about the, the crowd who was sick in the wilderness. What did they do? Moses put a, a serpent on a pole and just by looking at the serpent, in a distance, they were healed physically. The same is true with Jesus. If you'll just look to Jesus, if you'll look by faith to Jesus, if you'll entrust your life to Jesus, he'll spiritually heal your life. And your future will have physical healing in it, no matter what the ailment, because he will raise you up to eternal life. And I want you to understand how loving God is. Second Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The reason God has not returned yet is because, not because of his slowness, not because of his impatience, it's because he has many in this city and many in the cities of the world who are his people and he's drawing them to himself and he's planning to give them to his son. A passage that I love is 1 Corinthians 13, I believe, when Paul goes to Corinth and he's scared because it's a scary city and he knows they're not gonna wanna know what he, hear what he has to say. And yet he goes to bed that night and the Lord appears to him in a vision and says, I have many in that city who are my people. The Lord knows his people and the Lord is drawing his people to himself. And he says to Paul, open your mouth boldly. Go into that city and preach the gospel and leave the results in my hands. Leave the drawing in my hands. Leave all those who would come and believe in my hands. And if you're here today and you struggle to wonder whether or not you've been drawn by the Father or whether or not you've been given to the Son, first off, that's a great thing to wrestle with. And the second thing, come to Jesus. Don't wait. Repent and believe today. Put your faith in Christ alone today. Die to the things of this world today. Stop laboring for the food that perishes today. And eat, partake of the bread of life. Maybe you're here and you're struggling with some of the truths from last week, like whether or not you're treasuring Jesus above everything else or whether you're storing up treasure in heaven or not, or whether you're laboring for the food that endures to eternal life. I want you to rejoice this morning in the security of the believer. The truths that God gives you to the Son and God has secured you for eternity, that should cause you to be more faithful, should cause you to be more worshipful, cause you to be more prayerful, 
cause you to be more passionate and fired up about Jesus Christ in your life. Uh, You don't do any of that stuff for duty. You do it out of delight because of what God has done for you. And the duration of your future is forever. The purpose of your life has been restored in Jesus. The chapter of eternal life has been added to your days. And so when you die, uh, you're not going in the ground. You're going to live with Christ forever to the praise of God's glorious grace. And the end promises to be one of resurrection life and perfection for all who come and repent and believe. So allow the glorious truths that we see in this passage to cause you to feast on Jesus every day. (laughs) You can't get enough of them. You keep coming to the table, keep coming to the table. You wake up every morning and open your Bible. You go to bed at night praying and thanking God. You get up early and come to a men's Bible study or go to a women's Bible study and you break up in men and women's groups and you get vulnerable and you share your struggles and you go on and on. You grow in your understanding of doctrine and the things of God, why? so that ultimately you would go to the world, so that you would present the message of hope to the world. I was thinking this, I heard this this week, if if I put up a picture from my Ethiopia trip of of a starving child, and I saw some starving children with flies all over their face and they're on the side of the road, every single person in here would be like, yo, let's put our money together and let's feed that baby. Like, let's get that baby help. Let's bring that baby home. Uh, let's, let's give that baby what it needs. You walk around every day rubbing shoulders with the same thing, spiritually starved people dying and on their way to hell. And you have the message of reconciliation. You have the message of hope. And Jesus should be an example to you that all you need to do is open your mouth boldly and speak it to the world and trust the Father to draw his own to himself. So go boldly and open your mouth and speak the gospel. I will close where I began with Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Go ahead and bow your heads for a moment. And perhaps right now our sovereign God is pricking your heart, drawing your heart, beckoning you to come and believe. And what I would encourage you with is this, don't walk out of this place without doing business with Jesus. Don't walk out of this place hoping in what you have, hoping in what you've been looking to. Don't walk out of this place with sin hidden in your heart. Bring it all into the light. Understand that if you respond to the Father's drawing, Jesus is waiting open-armed to never cast you out. And so I'd encourage you right now in your seat to say, Lord, I need you. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to make you Lord of my life and King of my heart. Tell Jesus, I, I don't want to live for myself anymore, but I want to live for the glory of God who is in heaven. Father, we come we just trust your hand we trust your power Lord, all of us we're just passing through 8 billion people on planet earth and yet Lord, this morning those of us who are in Christ we sit here and we say why us? Why have you been so good to us? Why have you been so gracious to us? Why your forgiveness? Why your mercy? Why this message? Why this access to the Bible? Lord, it should drop us to our knees and cause us to magnify you more. It should cause us to praise you more. It should cause us to glorify you more. So Lord, I pray for every person in the room. I pray that you'd soften all of our hearts to see more of Jesus, to hunger and thirst for more of Jesus, to cut off the things 
the food that perishes, the things of this world, and to live and to work toward and to entrust our lives to Jesus so that we would build up treasure in heaven and not this earth. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight like the crowd. And then, Father, in your sovereignty, I ask that you would draw many more in this church, in this community to yourself, that you would cause them to repent and believe and follow Christ, to give up the things of this world and to put their hope and trust in a Savior who died on the cross in their place as a substitute for their sins and has risen from the dead to be seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We worship you. We praise you. For you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, sing it out.